So I'm going to give you the entire simile of the saw. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathan Pandika's Park. Now on that occasion the Venerable Moliya Paguna was associating overmuch with bhikkhunis. He was associating so much with bhikkhunis that if a bhikkhu spoke dispraise of those bhikkhunis in his presence, he would become angry and displeased and he would make a case of it. And if any bhikkhu spoke dispraise of the venerable Moliya Paguna, in those bhikkhunis' presence, they would become angry and displeased and make a case of it. So much was the venerable Moliya Paguna associating with bhikkhunis. Then a certain monk went to the Blessed One after paying homage to him, sat down at one side and told the Blessed One what was taking place. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain monk thus, Come monk, tell the monk Malia Paguna in, in the teachers, in the name that, in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and he went to the venerable Malia Paguna and told him, the teacher calls you friend Paguna. Yes, friend, he replied. And he went to the blessed one after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The blessed one asked him, Paguna, is it true that you're associating overmuch with bhikkhunis? That you're associating so much with the bhikkhunis that if any bhikkhu speaks dispraise of those bhikkhunis in your presence, you become angry and displeased and make a case of it. And if any monk <coughs> speaks dispra dispraise and me, uh, of those bhikkhunis in those bhikkhunis' presence, they become angry and displeased and make a case of it. Are you associating so much with bhikkhunis as it seems? Yes, venerable sir. Paguna, are you not a clansman who's gone forth from out of faith from the home life into homelessness? Yes, venerable sir. Paguna, it is not proper for you, a clansman gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness to associate over much with bhikkhunis. Therefore, if anyone speaks displeasure of those bhikkhunis in your presence, you should abandon any desire and any thoughts based on the household life. In other words, let go of your attachment. Stop hanging out with the bhikkhuni so much. And herein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. That is how you should train bhikkhuni. So what he's saying, the Buddha is saying, is whoever is giving criticism, instead of getting angry with them and becoming displeased, you should train by sending loving and kind thoughts to that person, not by arguing with them. Sounds like pretty good advice, doesn't it? 
If anyone gives those bhikkhunis a blow with his hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife in your presence, you should abandon any de de desires or thoughts on the household life. Uh, fighting verbally with them. Now, if I were to see a bhikkhuni being struck by someone else, I would stand in between them and say, please don't do that. In other words, not get in a physical altercation, but just get in the way of somebody that's doing something wrong. That's the job of the monks. And herein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected. And I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. If anyone speaks dispraise in your presence, you should abandon any desire and any thoughts based on the household life. In other words, not get angry, say words that later you wish you didn't say, do things later that you wish you didn't do. And herein you should train thus, my mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hatred. In other words, it's best not to say anything and just radiate loving kindness to that person. So what's, what's the big deal? They come up and somebody comes up at you, I don't care, it can be your boss, it can be another person that you deal with daily. They come up at you with their anger because of something. What is your job? Radiate loving kindness to that person. Don't pay attention to what they're saying. Doesn't matter what they're saying. And they can be really ready for blows. But when you start radiating loving kindness, one of two things will happen. Either they'll turn around and walk away, or they'll start calming down. It happens. <coughs> People that are angry, when you see them really going at each other, you start radiating loving kindness to both of them. You know how much they're suffering. So you start radiating loving kindness to them. And when you do that, it starts changing the situation. Before long, they're not yelling at each other so much anymore. They're starting to talk to each other. And as you continue loving, kind, giving them loving kindness, you can see in their faces that all of a sudden they start lightening up and becoming happy. And they can even start laughing with each other. Now this has happened more than one time. And what they do then is they say, well, I've got to go do this, I've got to go do that. Thanks, Bonte. And then they leave. And I haven't said anything. I haven't tried to get them to stop. 
they feel that loving kindness coming towards them and they can't hold on to that anger then or that dissatisfaction. So <clears throat> I'm teaching you a skill that you can use anytime. The trick is to remember to do it. Not get caught up in the emotional nonsense and rubbish. <laughs> If anyone should give you a blow with his hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife, you should abandon any desires and any thoughts based on the household life. Therein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. That is how you should train. One time I was taking a, a flight somewhere, I don't remember, but I, I do remember that we stopped in Hong Kong and I had to change planes. So I'm walking down the hallway and this man comes up to me and slaps me in the face. And I said, why did you do that? He said, oh, you Hare Krishna. I hate Hare Krishna. They're always <laughs> trying to, you're always trying to get something from me. And I said, well, I'm a Buddhist monk. And I'm not a Hare Krishna. No. Don't do that again, please. And then he started settling down. And we started talking, and he actually wound up buying me lunch. <laughs> because I didn't give him a kind of response of, anger's coming at me, I'm going to turn it around and give it back. I was completely shocked that he did it. So, Why did you do that? That was dumb. <laughs> Then the Blessed One addressed the monks thus. Monks, there was an occasion when the monks satisfied my mind. Here I addressed the monks thus. Monks, I eat at a single session. By doing so, I'm free from illness and affliction and enjoy brightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. I said talking about when... when the Buddha first started teaching. The monks could eat any time during the day. And then uh, they would eat an evening meal and they would try to walk back to the monastery at night and they'd fall into holes and cesspools and bump into sleeping cows and scare people because they couldn't see. So the Buddha said, don't eat an evening meal. And rather than the monks complaining because that's the best meal of the day, they just said, okay. So the Buddha came up with some rules about when you could eat and when you can't. You can start eating a half an hour before sunrise up to high noon. No food the rest of the day. And so the monks actually wind up fasting for about 16 hours a day. And it, you get very nice and healthy when you do that. It's an interesting phenomena that if I feel a cold coming on, I take some vitamin C. Some, if I have vitamin D3 around, I'll take a bunch of those. Lay down and rest. 
Now you have a you have a window that's about an hour when you start feeling sore throat, you start feeling achy. If you start taking rest then and taking your vitamin C's, um, the cold will last oh sometimes as much as six hours. Now I learned this in Burma because I was staying in kind of a dormitory situation where there was a lot of monks in a small area. And I felt a cold coming on. And rather than get up, go into the meditation hall, try to power my through my way through the cold, I just laid down and rest. Every four hours I would take more vitamin C. And by the end of the day I was ready to continue on. But all of the other monks that did that started to feel the cold coming on, they tried to power their way through it. And they wound up having a cold for at least a week. So which is more skillful to do? So listen to your body. Oh, I've got to go to work. No, you don't. You've got to take care of yourself. Pay attention to what your body is doing. I don't eat. When I feel a cold coming on, I will not eat. All I do is drink water. And what happens in your body is the enzymes that go to digest food, they start wandering around your body in different places and they start eating away the cause of the cold. And sometimes uh, I'll feel okay, but it's still tired, so I just Lying down, taking rest, not reading, not you know, doing anything on a computer, not anything but rest. There was a cold that was coming through one time that it wasn't a cold, it was some kind of major flu. And I started feeling it coming on, so I just laid down and started taking rest. And didn't take any food for three or four days. And kept just resting. After a while, you get kind of stiff from lying down, so get up and sit in a chair for a little while, then go back and lay down again. And this particular cold, this was some years ago, this particular kind of sickness, when people got it, it lasted about six weeks. After four days, I didn't have it anymore. Then I started eating a little bit of uh, rice soup, things like that. And after the second day, I was just eating normal meal and I didn't have it. I didn't have any kind of problem at all. <coughs> eating can cause problems. Oh, I have to eat every day or I'm going to die. When I was in Australia, <clears throat> I was eating one meal a day, just like I do right now. Although people are starting to give me more things in the morning. At home, I don't do those things. I drink a cup of coffee, that's it for my breakfast. Anyway, it got to be springtime 
and I started going where the monks were eating breakfast and I started nibbling a little bit of this and nibbling a little bit of that. And after a week or so, I started catching a cold. I immediately stopped eating, took rest, and from then on I only ate one meal a day and I was healthy. An awful lot of people have this idea, if I don't eat food, then I'm gonna, I am going to get sick. And it's just the opposite. So you need to pay attention to your, your body, what your body says. Not what your mind says. Your mind says, yeah, i got to eat or else I'm just not going to make it. <laughs> That's how some monks show that they don't, they aren't attached to food. Come monks, eat at a single session. By doing so, you will be free from illness and affliction. And you will enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. And I had no need to keep on instructing those monks. I only had to rouse mindfulness in them. Suppose there were a chariot on even ground at a crossroads, harnessed to thoroughbreds, waiting with a goad, lying ready, so that a skilled trainer, a charioteer, or a horse tamer might mount it, taking the reins in his left hand and the goad in his right hand, might drive out and back at any road whatever he likes. So too, I had no need to keep instructing those monks. I only had to arouse mindfulness in them. Therefore, monks, abandon what is unwholesome and devote yourself to wholesome states. For that is how you will come to growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. Suppose there was a big salad tree grove near a village or a town, and it was choked with castor oil weeds, and some men would appear desiring its good welfare and protection. He would cut down and throw out the, the crooked saplings that robbed the sap. He would clean up the interior of the grove and tend the straight, well-formed saplings so that the salad tree grove later would come to growth, increase, and fulfillment. So too, monks, abandon what is unwholesome. Devote yourself to wholesome states, for that is how you will come to growth, increase, and fulfillment in this Dhamma and discipline. And another thing about eating that is rather important. An awful lot of people, when they eat, they don't chew their food very much. And they have a tendency to get sick. In uh, another one of the Nikayas, it talks about the way the Buddha ate his food. And it says that he didn't swallow his food till every grain of rice was chewed at least once. So when you're eating your food, you want to eat and chew until it turns liquid in your mouth. And then swallow it. By doing that, you become much more healthy. I had some friends that were doctors 
and they would come and they would bring food, just wonderful food. And they would go to another table and eat. And within three minutes, they were done with their food. Now, these are doctors. I'd say, why are you eating so fast? Oh, because we have to. We've been trained to eat fast. Well, I say, train yourself to eat slow and chew your food. Doctors, grow, they die younger than most other people because they really don't take care of their bodies very well. And people that are very fat, they put food in their mouth, chew two or three times, swallow. So they have these big lumps that get in the stomach, and your body has their, their body has a hard time digesting it. And they have all kinds of illnesses and problems. So chewing your food, and eating at an at a even rate leads to your happiness and well-being for a lot longer period of time. Formerly monks in the same Sawat, in this same Sawati, there was a housewife named Vadika, and a good report of Mistress Vadika was spread thus Mistress Vadika is gentle, Mistress Vadika is meek, Mistress Vadika is peaceful. Now, Mistress, Mistress Vadika had a maid named Callie who was clever nimble and neat in her work. The maid Callie thought, good report of my lady has spread thus. Mistress Fadika is gentle, meek, and peaceful. Now, is it, how is it now? Well, she does not show anger. It is nonetheless actually present in her, or is it absent? Or else is it just because my, my work is neat and my lady shows no anger, though it actually is present in her? Suppose I test my lady. So the maid Callie got up late. When Mistress Vidika said, Hey Callie, what is it, madam? What's the matter that you get up so late? Nothing is the matter, madam. Nothing is the matter, you wicked girl. You get up so late. And she was angry and displeased and scowled. Then the, the maid Callie thought, the fact is, while well, my lady does not show anger, it's actually present in her, not absent. And it's just because my work is neat that my lady shows no anger though it's actually present in her, not absent. Suppose I test my lady a little more. So the maid Callie got up later in the day. Then Mistress Vidika said, Hey, Callie, what is it, madam? What's the matter that you get up later in the day? Nothing is the matter, madam. Nothing is a matter, you wicked girl. Yet you get up later in the day, and she was angry and displeased, and she spoke words of displeasure. <coughs> <coughs> then the, the maid Callie thought, the fact is, while my lady does not show anger, it's actually present in her, not absent. And it's because my work is neat that my lady shows no anger, though it's actually present in her, not absent. Suppose I test my lady a little more. So the maid Callie got up still later in the day. Then the mistress Vidika said, Hey Callie, 
What is it, madam? What's the matter with you that you get up still later in the day? Nothing is a matter, madam. Nothing is a matter, you wicked girl. Yet you get up still later in the day. And she was angry and displeased. And she took a rolling pin and gave her a blow on the head and cut her head. Then the maid Callie, with blood flowing from a cut in her head, denounced her mistress to the neighbors. See, ladies, the gentle ladies work. See, ladies, the meek ladies work. See, ladies, the peaceful ladies work. How can she become angry and displeased with her only maid for getting up late? How can she take a rolling pin and give her a blow on the head and cut her head? Then later, a bad report of Mistress Fadika spread thus. Mistress Fadika is rough. Mistress Fadika is violent. Mistress Fadika is merciless. So too, monks, some monk is extremely gentle, extremely meek, extremely peaceful, so long as disagreeable courses of speech do not touch him. But it is when disagreeable courses of speech touch him that it can be understood whether that monk is really kind, gentle, and peaceful. I do not call a monk easy to admonish who is easy to admonish and makes himself easy to admonish only for the sake of getting robes, alms, food, resting place, and medicines. Why is that? Because that monk is not easy to admonish or makes himself easy to admonish when he gets no robes, alms, food, resting place, or rec. Uh, medicinal requisites. When a monk is easy to admonish and makes himself easy to admonish because he honors, respects, and reveres the Dhamma, him I call easy to admonish. Uh, when I was in Sri Lanka, there was a, uh, a young Samanera. I, he must have been 12 years old. And he was basically getting into trouble about every day. And they would tell him to stop doing this or that. He, he liked to tease the dog and make him snap and things like that. And the dog started getting mean. And they told him over and over again, don't do that. So the head monk comes to me and he said, I want you to, to admonish this Samanera. And I said, okay. So I called him into my room. I didn't say anything to him. But I, I let the dog into my room and I just started petting the dog and talking to the dog in a nice way. And he started feeling guilty for treating the dog the way he had. And he stopped doing that. Now, admonishing someone else doesn't necessarily mean saying something to them. It means being the example. I could have gotten angry at him for causing pain to some, some other being, but I didn't. And then he started reading, uh, let's call it layman magazines, where he would have lust or dislike come up in his mind. And they found the books. And again, they said, well, can you admonish him? Okay. He came into the room. I just started radiating loving kindness and I didn't pay attention to him at all. 
And then after about a half an hour, I said, okay, go away. He stopped doing that. See how easy it is to correct other people's mistakes by your example, mm -hmm. by radiating loving kindness. And after that, he, was, he would follow me around like a little puppy dog. He really liked being beside me and talking to him and things like that. But I wouldn't do it if he was going to act in a way that wasn't right. And it was real important for him that I liked him. So he would act very kindly. Now I was there for a month. I had the head monk write back to me after I left and he said that he was amazed at how good that little boy was behaving. And he asked me how I admonished him. I said, all I did really was showing how to have loving kindness and radiate loving kindness to him. I was radiating loving kindness to the dog when I was scratching the dog. And that's all he needed to get straight. He knew that that was a good thing. So why not carry a lesson like that with you into your daily activities? You don't have to speak harshly to other people. You can be kind. You can radiate loving kindness to them. Oh, but if I'm kind and loving, they're going to take advantage of me. No, they don't. That's one of the big worries in Asia. If I'm kind to somebody, they're, they're going to take advantage and they're always going to start demanding that you be kind to them. It's easy to radiate loving kindness all the time. That's what this sutta is about. Learning how to radiate loving kindness so that you start affecting the world around you in a positive way. And there are some times when you see somebody and you just don't get a good feeling from them and you let your mind start to think about how you don't like that person. I don't want to be around that person. They're, they're loud, they're boisterous. They're highly emotional. This is one of the things that happens in Asia. A lot of people that are really suffering a lot they come and spend time at the monasteries because they feel good at the monasteries. They feel like people love them and appreciate them at the monasteries and their behavior starts to change. So it's a real necessary part of the spiritual practice to share your loving kindness with other beings as much as you can remember to do that. While I was in Malaysia, there were people that were going in the hospital with pretty major diseases and they were getting close to death so they would ask me to come and see them at the hospital and after a while there were so many people that were asking me I was going about every day <clears throat> so I would walk into the hospital walk to their room stop and remind myself that whatever pain they have is theirs I cannot take their pain away from them. But I can love them. So I started radiating loving kindness as I was walking in the room. 
And often people said, you know, every time you come in the room, it's like fresh air coming in the room. Because I wasn't trying to make them better. All I was doing was loving them the way they were. I would walk in the room and they would be in extreme pain and they would be moaning and groaning. And after a couple minutes, they started quieting down, they started feeling better. Because I was radiating loving kindness to them, their mind came up to where my mind was. I didn't walk in and go, oh, you poor dear, I feel so sorry for you. I didn't do that. They have pain, okay. It's theirs. I can't take your pain away. I can't. Your pain is your pain. But I can love you. And it was always so interesting going in and it looked like I wasn't doing anything in particular, but they always felt better after I left. And I would say things that would make them laugh. And they felt a lot better when they did that. But I didn't try to make them healthy. I didn't try to make them happy. I didn't try to make them change so that they would all of a sudden get jump out of bed and start doing cartwheels. All I did was love them. And sometimes they would get better and come out of the hospital and, and live longer lives. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they died. And that was okay. It had to be okay because that was the truth. The worst thing that happens when somebody is sick is the feeling of helplessness. You feel like, well, there's nothing I can do. So you go visit the sick person and you come into the room and you see them suffering and you start, oh, I'm, and you don't say anything, but you're putting off a feeling of aversion. And then they go into the room and they straighten a pillow and they close a window or open a window and then they go, well, I'll see you later. And they leave and they feel very inadequate and sad. That's a feeling of helplessness. You don't have to be helpless. You can help just by radiating loving kindness to that person. It helps them a lot. You can radiate loving kindness to the family members that feel completely helpless. You can talk to the family members about just start giving love. Do that as much as you can. Don't push it. Don't force anything on the person, but love them. That's enough. You don't feel helpless. They appreciate your coming. The thing that everybody wants in life, I don't care who it is, Everybody wants to be loved. So, do it. <laughs> Send them love. You can't give something to somebody else that you don't have. So, you have to give yourself some loving kindness too. You have to bring up a feeling of loving kindness. Feel that loving kindness and then give it away. That's the first part of meditation. 
practicing your generosity. Ah, the monk's talking about generosity. I better put my hand on my pocket because that's my money pocket. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of generosity that I'm talking about is giving your happiness to other people. Giving your joy to other people. Affect the world around you in a positive way. I love to go into big stores uh, where we live, the, about the only place we can uh, get food, buy food, is at Walmart. I know it's a dirty word, but there, that's the only place available, so that's where we go. And <clears throat> these, a mother will be there and the, the baby is crying a lot. I want this, I want that. <laughs> so what I do is I go stand beside the cart and I start radiating loving kindness to that baby. And they stop. They stop crying and they look at me with this look of wonder on their face. And I smile to them. And then I say something to their, to mom who's been hassled because the baby's crying so much. And I say something about them being very good little children, and how lucky they are. And then I walk away. How did I affect the world around me? Do you see how it works? Practice that as much as you can remember to practice it. This is not just a sitting practice. This is an all the time practice. The more you can remember to send love and kind thoughts to other people, the easier life becomes and you start seeing true miracles occur. There was a lady that I was in the hospital. This boy came up to me and said, my mother just got out of an operation. They cut open her stomach and she has cancer. Can you go see her? I said, oh, sure, why not? So I went and she was in the recovery room. And she was knocked out. And she had a, a mask, and it was a clear mask, over her mouth, and she was getting oxygen. So, okay, that's fine. So I started radiating loving kindness to her. Now, she was under anesthetic. She didn't really know that I was there, I didn't think. Uh, quite often students would come with me to the hospital because they liked doing that sort of thing and being inspired and that sort of thing. And my student came up and said, look at her. I had my eyes closed. I wasn't really doing anything but just radiating a happy feeling. So I opened up my eyes and I looked down at her and she had this huge smile. She wasn't even conscious and she saw the effect of that. This stuff works, but you have to practice it. And there's not one situation that doesn't get better when you practice loving kindness. That's why this says that there's great benefit and you become prosperous when you start giving all the time. 
Everything becomes easier. When you start trusting Dhamma, Dhamma will take care of you. I don't worry about things. Things happen, okay, fine. They don't happen, okay, it'll happen another way. Uh, we have a treasurer at uh, Damasuka that gets real concerned when the money starts getting low. And he, he comes to me and he said, we've only got enough money to <coughs> last one more month and that's it. Uh, I don't, okay, fine. <laughs> what, me worry? I said, did nothing to worry about. And then somebody the next day or two sends us $5,000. Oh, that's enough to keep going for another few months. Don't worry about it. When you take care of Dhamma, Dhamma takes care of you. You don't always get what you want, but you always get what you need. And it really does work that way. So the more you can practice your generosity and giving kind speech, kind thoughts, kind actions, you will start to notice that everything in your life is easier. You need something to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Just keep giving. And all of a sudden, miracles start happening. It's pretty remarkable. We have a dining hall. Very big and the library above the dining hall. And we had somebody that was building that wasn't building the way we wanted it built. And we wound up having to let that person go and find somebody else and we found the perfect person that could fix all the stuff that they screwed up and made it the way we want it. And now that is a very, very beautiful building. And it has a lot of good feeling in it because that, uh, that builder, he took joy in doing things and making things right. And he wound up building our meditation hall. It's an incredibly beautiful place. It's really wonderful. When you walk in, you really feel good. How did I build that? I don't have any money. Money just started coming in. I pointed my mind in the direction we need this. It doesn't happen as fast as we want sometimes, but that doesn't matter. Before too long, we're going to be doing a lot more building for the women's section. For uh, having a meeting hall where the women can come and if they want to be nuns, they can come and ordain. They'll have a place. They'll have all the food they need. All the requisites are there. But we don't have any money. Why worry about it? 
It'll come when it's, when it's time. So, <clears throat> the less you worry about things, the more you spend radiating loving kindness and giving it away, the more you will start to see wonderful things happening in your life. There was a lady that came to me and she said when she, her, her father died when she was 17 and she in, was supposed to inherit a huge amount of money. But her uncle took it. And she had hated him. Well, she was in her 40s, so it was a lot of years. Hated him for doing that to her. So she said, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm so angry because he took something that wasn't his. So I said, well, forgive him. He made a mistake. Okay, he made a mistake. So what? So she did. She forgave him in her mind. And she started feeling a lot lighter and a lot happier. She got off retreat, went home. He called her up and asked her to forgive him. And she said, I already did. Now, that's a miracle. Holding on to unwholesome states leads to your sadness and suffering. Radiating loving kindness and kind feelings, saying things that are kind to other people and make them happy, think happy thoughts, that leads to your happiness and well-being for a long time. That's what this teaching is all about. It's not about getting something. It's about giving something. Okay. <clears throat> Monks, there are five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, <coughs> spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hatred. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. You should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness. Without inner hate, we shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with him, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. Sounds like pretty good advice to me. You know, there's some people that get really upset because somebody says something they know it's not true. Oh, you're lying to me, and I get angry. What <coughs> difference does it make? 
honestly, what difference does it make? <coughs> you can make yourself happy, you can make yourself sad. It's up to you what you choose. But everybody that you meet and you speak with them, you use them as your reminder to send loving and kind thoughts to them. Do you know them? Maybe not. Complete stranger. So? That's fine. And use that person as their reminder for the rest of the time to radiate loving kindness to all beings in all the directions. I try to get you to smile. Why? Because when you smile, you have a light mind. And it helps joy arise. When you have joy in your mind, your awareness is very quick. Your mind is very clear. It's not clouded with <coughs> nonsense and rubbish thoughts. And it's real easy to see when that joy disappears and your mind starts to get caught up in something. That's why smiling is such a necessary part of the practice. It helps your mindfulness to get better. There was uh, somebody in Australia that started writing to me and they said, I've been practicing absorption concentration for seven years. I don't see any personality development. Do you teach something different than that? So I said, yes. Will you teach me? Yes. Okay, all you have to do is when you're doing your breathing meditation on the in-breath, relax. On the out-breath, relax. If there's a distraction, let it be. Relax. Smile and come back to the breath and relax on the in-breath and relax on the out-breath. But he'd been developing this for seven years and he would forget. And I kept telling him over and over the same thing, but he wasn't getting it. And I started getting tired of doing that. So I said, okay, now, I want you to change your meditation. Because you have this old habit of practicing in this way Let's give you something new and exciting that you have to start all over again. Loving kindness meditation. He came back and he started saying, well, my mind takes off all over the place. I'm going to go back to the breathing. At least I get happy when I'm doing that. No, don't do that. Learn about the hindrances and that sort of thing. And we went back and forth quite a bit. And finally, I got so fed up with him that I told him, I don't want you to sit for a week. All I want you to do is smile all day. And when you forget to smile, then laugh. And I didn't hear from him. And a week later, he writes back and he said, I took what you said very seriously. And this is what happened in my practice. I didn't sit in meditation at all. But I started smiling. And I started noticing that Always before, when I was walking from one place to another, I was in this mental haze. My head was down and I was just caught up in nonsense stuff. When I started smiling, my posture changed and I started looking around. And I started smiling and 
people actually smiled back? And he said, they never did that before. And he said, you know, even when I didn't feel like smiling, I would smile anyway, and my mind was always better because I was smiling. And he gave me a whole bunch of different examples of the advantage of smiling. And then I wrote to him and I said, have you noticed that your mindfulness is a little different? And he said, I didn't even know what mindfulness was. And yeah, now my mindfulness is very sharp. And then he said something to me that was rather a shock. He said, uh, the doctors saw me and now I don't have to take so many drugs. Drugs? But what are we talking about here, drugs? He said, well, I'm in a mental institute. <laughs> I have this bipolar problem. And they, they drug me out so heavy that all I do is just I'm a zombie. And now they're seeing me smile and interact with other people and talk with them. And they thought that was a good sign so they stopped giving me so much drugs. Uh, when he went in to that institute, they told him he was going to be there for the rest of his life. He practiced loving-kindness meditation and smiling for about six months, and he moved out. And he's on his own now. He still goes through, through his ups and downs. But he doesn't have to take so many heavy drugs. Now, isn't that a miracle? I mean, really. The more we can remember to keep smiling and radiating loving kindness to other people, no matter what they say to us, the happier our mind becomes, the happier we become, the more we affect people around us in a nice way. <clears throat> Monks, suppose a man came with a hoe in a basket and said, I shall make this great earth be without earth. And he would dig here and there and strew the soil here and there and spit here and there and urinate here and there saying, be without earth, be without earth. What do you think, monks? Could that man make this great earth be without earth? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because this great, great earth is deep and immeasurable and it's not easy to make it be without earth. Eventually the man would reap weariness and disappointment. So too, monks, there are these five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely, when others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Wherein you should train thus, our mind will remain unaffected.
and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with him. We shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and ill will. That is how you should train. Monks, suppose a man came with crimson, turmeric, indigo, and carmine and said, I shall draw pictures and make pictures appear on empty space. What do you think, monks? Would that man draw pictures and make pictures appear on empty space? No, venerable sir. Why is that? Because space is formless and non-manifestive, it's not easy to draw pictures or make pictures appear there. Eventually, that man would reap only weariness and disappointment. So too, monks. There are these five courses of speech. that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Herein you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. And we shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with him, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how we should train. Monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely limb by limb with a two-handed saw, he who gave rise to one thought moment of hatred towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. That's <laughs> fairly radical. You should train thus, our minds will be unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with them. We shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train. Monks, if you keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind, do you see any course of speech, trivial or gross, that you could not endure? No, venerable sir. Therefore, monks, you should keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in your mind. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. 
So this is the last day of the retreat. <clears throat> and a lot of people ask me, now what? <laughs> I think that you should be sitting for at least 45 minutes a day. And if you can sit for longer, if you have time to sit longer, please do that. Smile lots. Wish other people happiness lots. The whole of this talk has been about what you can do to affect yourself and others around you. So, that's how you practice. Do it often. You see your mind starts to get a little upset about something, start sending yourself loving kindness and use yourself as the reminder to start sending other people loving kindness. This is not a sometime practice. This is an all the time practice. One of the problems that a lot of Zen people, when they first came here to this country, they said meditation is sitting. That's it. Sit. Don't say anything. Sit. That's it. Well, they're missing out on three quarters of what the practice actually is. You practice your generosity as much as you can, wishing other people happiness. and watch how much easier everything becomes. When you do that, you are taking care of the Dhamma. And because you take care of the Dhamma, the Dhamma does take care of you. Watch how it happens. Okay. Now, do you have any Questions, last questions. Yes. How is the, uh, the person that we find hiking uh, uh, Jesus Christ, would he be a good example of the similar to Saul? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know because I'm not there. I know that for Jesus there were some moments of doubt. Father, why have you forsaken me? That's not a wholesome thing. But he certainly seemed to not uh, give anger back. At least. <sighs> Who knows for sure unless you're there. I mean, he could have been using words that weren't very nice while he was being tortured. Who knows? But there is a story in the uh, in the Jataka tales about the Bodhisatta. He was about a year and a half old. He was a prince. And his mother really liked him a lot. And he was all, she was always playing with him and being with him. And, and one day the king walked in the room and said something to the queen, his mother, and he didn't hear, or she didn't hear what he said. And he got angry. So he called his executioner. And he said, in his mind, he's thinking, you know what's going to happen is 
this young boy is going to grow up and he's going to get a little older and then he's going to usurp, usurp me and, and I'm not going to be king anymore and I don't want that to happen. And she, he's going to have the support of the mother. So when he called the executioner, the executioner comes and the king says, take off his hands. And when the bodhisattva, now he's only a year and a half, when he hears this, he, he sees this as an opportunity to practice loving kindness to all the different kinds of beings. Loving kindness to somebody that he dearly loved, loving kindness to himself, loving kindness to a neutral person, loving kindness to an enemy. So he started focusing on loving kindness as he had his hands chopped off. And the mother was completely shocked by that and she had his hands in her, in her lap and she was crying and the bodhisattva didn't cry when he had his hands cut off because he was focusing on loving kindness. And it made the king that much more angry. So he said, lop off his feet. So the executioner cut off his feet, still didn't cry. Finally, the king says, ah, oh, this is really a disgusting little child. Just cut off his head. And he did. And because he was focusing on loving kindness, he was reborn in a devaloka, in a happy existence. And he didn't entertain one thought of dissatisfaction because that was what was happening to him in the moment. So he was the example of doing that in one of his past lifetimes, at least one. Okay? Anybody else? So you don't have any questions. That means everybody knows exactly what they're doing. Is this talk on your um, website? Yes. More than one time. Great. <laughs> Can we get an email with the talk you gave and where they correspond on the we did, We're going to do better than that. We're putting it on YouTube and you can see it. Okay. Yeah, there's already an online retreat new playlist on YouTube on the Begin to See channel. It's all linked up on the front page. Wow. And it, it, it goes through all these <laughs> wow. talks. And this talk is at the end. And uh, if you've got 38, you've got 20. I mean, you've got all the talks. They're right there. Just go right through them. And you can do an online retreat mm. and still do your, um, your business daily activity kind of stuff. What we want you to do is a morning service when you get up and then sit for one hour then go to work. Now your, your job while you're at work is to smile <laughs> a lot. And practice loving kindness. And practice your loving kindness. And then at lunchtime, if you have some time, sit in meditation. When you get home, you write to us and tell us how your meditation is going. We have some comments back to you. Then we tell you a sutta to listen to. After that, sit in meditation for at least another hour. These retreats are eight days? Eight days long. Eight it's days Friday long. Friday and then end up the following, not that, the following Sunday. When do you have to say that? They start on a Friday night. We do an introduction from noon to like 
or whoever's teaching you that okay, your background. And then your day one report is on Saturday and it runs till the following Sunday. So you can keep your practice going pretty well and it's really kind of a remarkable thing how you continue to progress just by doing the online retreat. Yeah, we, have, <laughs> we have Prashant here tonight. He's visiting us for the day. He did an online retreat. That's how he found out about us and was introduced to the practice. So he came here and he sat an hour the first time and then I said get out the floor and get in a chair and he sat two hours. <laughs> So he's doing, you know, he really understands the practice. He, he really, it's a good way to introduce you to it. And a lot of people last year, I don't remember, David, how many, I think it's like seven or eight of them, came, came during the summer to the center after they had done a retreat during the year. But that's the idea. It's like to get you in touch or if you're already practicing, to keep you in tune. And they're once a month. And if you want to join, you have to sign up. Okay. There's not going to be one in May, but there will be one in June. And, and then it'll go up to the rest. Okay. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. <coughs> as long as we're in the center. <coughs> I would suggest that you go to the website. There's many hundreds of talks that you can listen to. There's many hundreds of talks that, that are on YouTube. And that can help you a lot. And I have to tell you, I listen to my own talks. <laughs> and I get excited listening to them. <laughs> and he keeps wanting to know, who is this guy? <laughs> Do an online retreat with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, anything else? I have a question about the analogy that the Buddha uses. Uh, for instance, the dirt and drawing in the air. And then he goes and gives the direction to loving kindness. I don't see the connection, I didn't see the connection about the impossibility of trying to draw in, the, in space and sending loving kindness. Think about it. I'm not going to give you an answer. Well, I mean, my, you my thought, think about it first. My Let it sink in. It's impossible to try to change other people. The best thing to do is just send loving kindness. And oh. <laughs> So you already knew the answer. <laughs> well, that was my, I just wanted to, yes, that was my idea what the answer was. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? This is your last chance. Okay. Share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.